Welcome to the Grad Futures Podcast, produced and hosted by graduate students at the Graduate School at Princeton University. I'm Eva Kubu, Associate Dean for Professional Development. We're on a mission to shape new narratives about professional success with a PhD to help graduate students everywhere envision and create their futures. Thank you for listening and subscribing. I'm your host, Helen Wainena, a new media fellow at the Graduate School and a graduate student in the Department of English at Princeton. Today, I'll be speaking with Leonard Casuto. Lenny is a professor of English at Fordham University and a columnist on graduate education for the Chronicle of Higher Education. He is the author or editor of nine books on subjects ranging from crime fiction to sports. His most recent two books, The Graduate School Mess and The New PhD, How to Build a Better Graduate Education, co-written with Robert Weisbuck, look at the state of American education. Lenny, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Selwyn. I'm glad to be here. Uh, what I love to do in the beginning is to sort of get a, a snapshot from your own words about your journey to where you are currently today as a professor and also as a columnist for uh, the higher education. I mean, you, you have this wealth of knowledge, teaching, um, doing scholarship, and, and now uh, a really vested interest vested interest in the ecosystem that is academic institutions. So can you just describe for our listeners how you came to occupy this position? Well, I've, I've always been vested in American higher education in the sense that it's paid my bills, but <laughs> I think that I've become much more interested in how it works. I've tried to recognize opportunities when they happen to me, but I've also tried to create them for myself. As I said, with mixed success. Mm -hmm. and so so when I, when I entered the academy, I got lucky and I got a job, and I worked very hard to get tenure, and I refused to allow myself to look past that event horizon. Mm -hmm. It was maybe even a matter of superstition. I just uh, refused <laughs> to consider anything uh, about what would happen after tenure because I wasn't sure I would get tenure, and I didn't want to start assuming it. Right. When I did finally get tenure, I had the good sense to get out of the the track that I had been running so hard in. And I, I went to Africa for half a year, and I taught at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And oh, that had the virtue of giving me the adventure that I thought I was seeking as a reward for working so hard. Mm -hmm. That was fine. But the better reward was that it yanked me out of the context that I was in and forced me to do something that I realized that I needed to do, to do, which was take stock, to look beyond the horizon now that I had finally reached it, to take, in effect, take my eyes off the road the, uh, the, uh, that was be beneath my feet and raise it to establish a new horizon. And I realized that, okay, I've, got, I've, I've, I've achieved this goal. I've given myself a measure of security and predictability in my employment, what am I now going to do? What kind of professor do I want to be when I grow up? <laughs> now that I've sort of grown up and I realized that I had some responsibility to make a, make a plan, not just to continue in the same vein that I had been, uh, been, been working because it wasn't appropriate now that I had achieved that first goal. This is very fascinating. So Part of my personal background um, is that my family is from Tanzania, <laughs> and my mother yeah. works at the University of Dar es Salaam um, as an administrator. She started as a secretary and has um, sort of worked her way up into sort of a, a kind of directorship level um, in the registrar's office. But if you ask my mom why it was so important for her to get us to the United States is she'll say that I never wanted my kids to go to the University of Dar es Salaam because students there struggle and there are all kinds of um, administrative hiccups and research hiccups. So I, I'm actually really curious about your experience at the University of Dar es Salaam and how it helped catalyze this. Let me find, let me actually define what it means to be a professor now. Oh, it was, it was a fascinating time. Dar es Salaam is far more selective than Harvard. If we think <laughs> about 
the number of of uh, bottlenecks and cut and cuts that the uh, selections that that the, that each student has to undergo before they actually get there, because uh, not simply higher edu- higher education is is not simply selective. Secondary education is selective. You know all yes. this. Mm-hmm. So uh, so my my students were immensely talented, but they were uh, very good rule followers because you have to be in order to get to a place like that. And of course, I am one too. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, trying to uh, separate them from some of their more cherished assumptions was something that I felt was my own duty while I was there, to break them out of the traditional British lecture and recitation format Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, get them to think for themselves Mm -hmm. uh, or formulate questions for themselves, try to answer them. Some of the students greatly resented this because it was an, an I was asking them to acquire a new skill and they weren't necessarily fluent at it to start with others were very grateful for it uh, it's been uh, it was tremendously gratifying and for me to live in that situation where I didn't have a telephone where if uh, somebody wanted to visit me they would just show up at my door and protocol dictated that I stop whatever I was doing invite the person in and uh, and visit. Mm-hmm. It slowed me down in ways that I had not been used to being slowed down. And that helped me in the reflection process that I was engaged in to think about, okay, what what do I want to do now? Mm-hmm. And when I, when I got back, I uh, started to reorganize myself professionally to do different kinds of writing writing for newspapers and magazines. Mm-hmm. And what were you writing about for these newspapers and Oh, magazines? all kinds of things. I was really having fun just uh, following my own interests. I, I wrote about science. I wrote about music. I was writing about sports. And also, in some cases, about literature for, for popular audiences. And it was um, a real sort of potpourri. I, I was um, learning the trade, And I was learning the trade by following my nose from this place to that, learning how to recognize where stories were. Essentially, I put myself through my own version of journalism school. Mm -hmm. And it was a a tremendous pleasure. I could do it at my own pace. And and I wound up with a a good good little portfolio of of freelance writing on a whole variety of subjects, much of which is uh, on my website now. Uh, but the uh, the regular column, well, started some of, some of the freelance writing that I that I was doing was on academic culture simply because it was something that I was in, I was living it, and so the I learned how to recognize ideas there, and I could pitch them to the Chronicle of Higher Education, which was a publication that I was already reading. I wrote a, a number of pieces for the Chronicle, and one day uh, I would uh, I I got an idea about something that I had been that I'd seen which was the the spectacle the very the very sad spectacle of the graduate student who doesn't finish and yet who remains around from year after year because nobody can bring themselves to say to that student you need to either finish or you need to leave mm-hmm. we need to find a way to help you finish, or we need to find a way to help you leave. Right. And uh, by finishing, you mean like defending their dissertation? Right, because finish they, writing the dissertation. Have, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're, they're have stuck. a job on the line? or Well, just they typically do not yet have a job on the line. They're stuck. Mm-hmm. The I think that any of us who spend time in the culture of graduate education will encounter graduate students who are stuck. While I was writing that piece, which was essentially, I started with the, how do you help a a graduate student to leave when it will be best for that student to leave? While I was writing that, I realized that there needed to be a companion piece. How do you help a graduate student who's stuck get unstuck? Right. So a prequel. (laughs) You You try to get them unstuck, and if it doesn't work, then you have to help them find an off ramp. Right. So I so I wrote that second piece, and... When I was finished, the editor said, how would you like to do this regularly? Hmm. And now we can say, okay, this is where I slap myself in the forehead and say, dope. (laughs) (laughs) Because, of course, I wanted to do this regularly, and I should have thought of this 
long before. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, the entrepreneurial failure. What I was describing before, where I found made myself in, uh, into a journalist, that to me, as I look back at it, is an example of entre entrepreneurial success in my life. You know, I'm not trying to um, to be conceited here. I want to recognize my successes and my failures together. But to not recognize that I wanted to be a columnist mm. and yet not have it occur to me that I should just go out and ask to become one. At that point, I, I'd written probably going on two dozen pieces for the Chronicle of Higher Education. At that point, it was my main outlet, right. not my only one, but my mm -hmm. main one. And uh, I'm sure they would have entertained a proposal from me. And so I look back and I think, I was I was an idiot not to <laughs> not to have recognized that and I need to recognize that moment and see how I can learn from it so that I can try to not overlook opportunities to do the things that I actually want to do. Mm -hmm. So of course I said yes yeah. to to the uh, to the offer to become a columnist that was more than 12 years ago. You're the second uh guest we've had who has come to say that after they received tenure, they had this sort of moment of re-evaluating the value and the contribution of their work. Um, the other person is Barry Lamb, who says after he got tenure, he felt the need to have a different relationship to the philosophy training that he had. And by sort of, you know, a string of coincidences, you might say, or opportunities or <laughs> happenings found himself really taken by the idea of creating a podcast that created narrative storytelling and ideas and philosophy. And, you know, to me, what I'm hearing you both say is that there were skills in in your repertoire that were not sort of maybe appreciated by or maybe only appreciated in sort of one particular lane, right? That you produce scholarship that is then read and peer reviewed <laughs> um, and serves serves its function in terms of the tenure track. Whereas there's an, those skills are not just applicable to the tenure track, they're applicable towards other things like writing publicly um, and taking your passion and curi you know, curiosity and research skills to sort of, to this other new direction, which is not as, clearly defined as the tenure track. Is that a common experience among professors, just to sort of broaden the scope? Because this is just, these are two examples that well, we've it, had on the podcast. It's not particularly common, but perhaps among podcast guests, it might be a little <laughs> bit more. But uh, I, I want to I answer that question in, ter in terms of two keywords, mm -hmm. information and responsibility. First, information. It has often been said by me <laughs> that uh, PhDs are information specialists. PhDs are the the foremost information specialists in the in the culture. I believe that uh, they not only know how to uh, how to find information, uh, and they've been trained to do so at a, a a greater level of depth and sophistication than any other form of educational training that's offered will will give. They um, so they know how to find it. They know how to work with it once the, once they do find it. That is to say separate out the parts that they that they realize have promise and from the parts that don't. You not only have to find, gather, shape, and shear information, but you need to be able to present it to some to to uh, different audiences so that they can understand it. Mm -hmm. And that that teaching function, it's not just about being in a classroom, although it is that. That's where a lot of PhDs learn their chops. But you're also learning how to present your information in different formats, including writing or perhaps podcast. So uh, in the, this idea of, of being a specialist in information is something that I think that a lot, of, a lot of PhDs and also PhDs in training don't realize that they have and are also continually acquiring, refining, getting better at. Right. And I think if we saw each other, saw ourselves – more accurately as experts, highly sophisticated experts in information, we might be able to see different kinds of ways that we can put that expertise to work that we don't necessarily, as a group, take full advantage of today. Right, that we narrow it down to a particular... Yes, to producing peer-reviewed <laughs> scholarship, for example. This, the second keyword, responsibility, 
is the the partnership the the partner word to freedom that academic freedom is a fetishized phrase mm-hmm. in American academia with plenty of good reasons it's got uh, it's got an important history in the formation of American colleges and universities and particularly the peop- the uh, the shape of the jobs of the people who work at them no freedom worth having at least by my lights comes without a responsibility and uh, in uh, United States academia Academic responsibility is something you don't hear about nearly as often as academic freedom. Mm. When I got tenure, I realized on some level and increasingly in an increasingly more explicit way that I had a responsibility, that I was being given a, a level of security and predictability in my work that would allow me to take chances if I wanted to, to be ambitious in ways that wouldn't necessarily be available to me if I were being reviewed every three, three or six months, and that I could um, choose to follow my uh, follow my interests in an area in in a way that would allow me to pursue what seemed to me to be most uh, most important toward creating the kind of sustainable academic culture that became increasingly central in my own mind. Mm -hmm. So for me, a lot of this was trying to figure out what my academic responsibility was. And I found it in writing for broader publics. Not all academics are going to do that, Mm -hmm. but some of them can and, uh, and some of them should. And those of us who can and should ought to have that, that not simply the freedom to do it, but should feel the need to do it because American academia, I would say academia in the Western world, has never needed ambassadors to the general public, the the general publics, I might say, more than it needs it now. Well, I'm thinking now about um, the sort of existing model of uh, graduate education. Um, And you've written in the higher, uh, higher education, the Chronicle of Higher Education, that that this model is not sustainable. And from my vantage point, um, that feels true because I know about the absence of jobs, right? I know that my chances of getting a job after I graduate is is very slim. So how, but I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, like how else is this model unsustainable? Let's talk about a key word, crisis. Mm-hmm. It's not a good keyword because crisis implies something that has uh, happened that's intense and of short duration. But what what has been variously been called the employment crisis in graduate education where we have uh, many too few professors' jobs for many too many PhDs to fill them, that's not a crisis at all in the sense that it has been going on for <laughs> over 50 years, five zero years. Right. If we think about the, that, go back to that 1960s time when more professors' jobs are being created in 10 years than in the hundreds of years before, well, that's, a, that's an expanding sector. During that decade, anybody who finished a PhD not only could have a professor's job if they wanted one, but they could pretty much choose what part of the country they could have it in. Mm. Now, as I said, more people were entering academia during that period than in any other time in the history of academia. And so they believed that that was normal. Right. Well, it wasn't normal. <laughs> that <laughs> The sector can't expand indefinitely. Yeah. <laughs> that if you have a, a, a teacher who teaches eight students one year and then eight students the next year and then eight students the year after that, the, uh, and they all want to be teachers just like that teacher, then you're talking about a pyramid that is constantly expanding. And if you, if, if you promise every one of those students that they're going to get a teacher's job just like their teacher, that's a pyramid scheme. <laughs> it's, but it becomes one only if you make the promise. Right. Only during the 1960s. Was that possible? Was that, was that, was that mathematically possible? Mm-hmm. Before the 1960s and after the 1960s, people went, went on and did different kinds of work. And the, 
the failure to recognize this fact, which is based on simple mathematics, mm -hmm. has created what I would call a second crisis. And this is uh, the also, also decades old, so not really a crisis, but it's an identity crisis. Mm -hmm. That the this this sense of what are you, what 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 are we as professors when we're doing when we're teaching graduate school, and what are we as graduate students when we're taking these classes. Uh, as, a, as a professor, if I imagine that every one of my graduate students is going to get an academic job, I'm not thinking responsibly. Mm. If I'm a graduate student and I imagine that, uh, that if I finish my Ph.D., I will certainly sh and surely get a professor's job, I'm not being responsible to myself. That's, so this, these are just numerical realities. But that doesn't mean that graduate school is an unsound enterprise. Right. The, that graduate school can continue to prepare students to become scholars, to become possible professors, even as it prepares them to become productive contributors to the public good, right. who can be satis happy, satisfied, and fulfilled in a variety of jobs. But it involves a transformation of consciousness. And with that transformation of consciousness will come other kinds of transformations, which professors have not always shown a willingness to engage in. Well, now we're sort of getting into the uh, path of talking about diverse career paths. And, um, and what would it look like for graduate education to have a student-centered employment narrative? There are two phrases that I want to focus on in your question. One is student-centered. Mm -hmm. You've brought that forward. It belongs front and center. The idea of student-centered graduate education is already a controversial idea because, and here's, here's the point, graduate school is historically faculty-centered. We may call it school, but <laughs> it's, it's, fac it's faculty-centered. I want to give two examples of this. The first is from the humanities, that any graduate student in the humanities has the experience of sitting in, se in, a, in a seminar that's being given by a professor and the seminar will have a title which might be paraphrased as uh, my next book. <laughs> so if it's the professor's next book, then how, is the student, how, how are the student's interests being, being served here? Maybe they are. They can, the students may acquire skills in the, in the course of studying the professor's next book. But the professor's next book is the, f the primary purpose here. Right. In the, in the sciences, we, have, we, haven't, we haven't talked too much about the sciences in, in, uh, specifically, but in, uh, for graduate students in the sciences get their dissertations from the, whatever projects that, that are funded in the, in the advisor's lab. The, the dissertations of students in the bench sciences are literally uh, taken from the research agenda of their professor advisor. Mm -hmm. who is running their lab. Graduate school is, the design of graduate school is faculty-centered, historically. And there's a way that this is true now. For us to say that it should be student-centered, that is, that the graduate education enterprise should proceed from the concerns of the graduate students rather than the faculty members, you're already talking about something that's revolutionary, even though the fact that graduate school is faculty-centered has been effaced mm -hmm. so thoroughly that it's hard to see how revolutionary it is. Right. So that's so. So the the idea of being student-centered is a lot more resonant than the than the phrase might initially suggest. It's not so benign in, on the graduate <laughs> on the graduate level. The the second phrase that I want that I want to focus on in your question is narrative. That is. So much of what we do in any workplace is it's a story that we're telling about ourselves, that when we ask what is it that we're doing in this workplace, the story that we tell the people, the, the professors and the graduate students in this scenario, it's crucial. If you, if you tell graduate students when they walk in the door, we're here to help you become, a profess to become professors, period, full stop, that's not a sound story to tell them. Right. 
it's in fact it will create expectations which as as we just discussed can't be ful- can't be filled in most cases right therefore if we tell that story we are teaching students by teaching them to have certain expectations that can't be fulfilled by teaching them to want something that you can't provide and to teach and at the same time teaching students to say that if you don't get that thing that anything else that you get will be second best or worse. What that is, is teaching students to be unhappy. <laughs> if you, and and how, can, how can we stand by and watch this happen? That how can we participate in it? Teaching students to be unhappy is practically the worst thing that a teacher can do. Yeah. And so that's part of the urgency that informs my own, my own work in this sector. Mm-hmm. that I'm, I see this happening everywhere. And it, dis, it, it doesn't distress me. It makes me distraught at, at times because these are some of the most talented young people that our, um, that, that our society can produce. And we're, um, we're teaching them to narrow their sights and to, um, to narrow the, the, the number of places where they can find fulfillment in their lives, that crosses over from an unethical almost to immoral. Mm. We can't do this. A, uh, somebody with a PhD, or for that matter, somebody without, them, without one, who is working out in the world, doing, doing a job and gaining fulfillment from it, well, that's, that's the best argument for graduate school there is. I'm curious if you can be more specific in terms of like how can universities sort of prepare graduate students for this alternative not just alternative but like um, to sort of broaden the scope of what a PhD uh, student or um, graduate can do Um, you know how how can or maybe even to sort of flip the question is to say how can university prepare employers for PhD those are two related questions. So what, so what can universities do to prepare students mm-hmm. for the kind of diversity that they are that, that, that their students will f- that, that students will face irrespective of whether they wind up in academia or not? Yes. And uh, how can universities educate employers about the value of graduate students? So let's take those questions quickly one at a time. How, how can universities help prepare students better? Well, that's a question that's best answered on the, on the level of the individual program. So how can, how can a, uh, a, a program in subject discipline, in discipline X, mm-hmm. prepare the graduate students in discipline X for a diversity of possible career outcomes, even as they help those students prepare for the academic career outcome? That is, we don't want to create a scenario where we're diluting the uh, the content of the discipline in favor of the kinds of skills that can help a student uh, the uh, in um, in uh, non academic workplaces. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've talked about how all PhD students are information specialists. First, there's how do you communicate the awareness you are an information specialist rather than you are a specialist in early Victorian literature. <laughs> right. And so, I can't do that. I can't do another job. I just, all I know how to do is early Victorian literature. Well, no. Actually, you're an information specialist. So some of it is about communicating skills that you are already imparting. But some of it is, can be adding to them. In the humanities, in this, the example of that class in Victorian literature, well, one of the things we know is that employers, while employers appreciate the level of uh, information skills that PhDs bring to the workplace. Humanities PhDs, understandably, don't have a lot of experience in team-based collaboration Mm -hmm. because a lot of of our work, particularly as we we become more advanced at it, is uh, writing, writing and researching alone. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. And so when when I teach graduate seminars... I give students team-based tasks because I want them to learn to work in teams. I don't do it with all of their tasks, but I do it with a lot of them. 
and I'm open to hearing their proposals about how they can do their tasks differently in different formats, for example, different media. Mm -hmm. But this idea of collaboration, I, intro I, I introduce it into my classes because I know that my students will need this. It doesn't dilute the content at all. It doesn't right. affect the content one bit. But it comes from my awareness that I'm responsible for helping them acquire the, a set of skills that will serve them not simply in academic workplaces, but also in a, a larger diversity of workplaces. Right. That, that individual instance is generalizable. Mm -hmm. That anybody, any professors aren't idiots. <laughs> we, we, you know, if we think hard about curriculum and how we can introduce the kinds of, of skills into curriculum, not at the expense of content, but as a way of delivering content that can help students in a variety of different settings, we ought to be doing that. Yeah. Now, your, the, the second question, how can universities serve, employ, serve employers? Well, there are, are, there are a lot of employers who are not particularly aware that PhDs can serve their employment needs better even than whatever, de whatever section of people, whatever demographic they're hiring from right now. The, right now, universities think nothing of convening employers for undergraduate career fairs. Mm -hmm. Why not have graduate career fairs? <laughs> How hard can it be, really? We already do this. There right. are people with skills in event planning who already know how. It would involve creating a, um, a, some, some extra literature where you're inviting employers to look for a different kind or a, a, more, a more sophisticated caliber of graduate. But there, there's, there's a lot of, of mutual interest here. Right. I interviewed years ago somebody who, uh, who worked in public relations, he said that uh, he loved hiring PhDs because he said they have this great skill set that somebody else already paid for. <laughs> yeah. and, that, uh, and so he, would put, he said he'd, put them in, he'd start them in, in, in lower middle management and he'd watch them rise like the opposite of a shooting star. <laughs> they, they, they'd, they'd ascend into the heavens really fast because once they, once they picked up the particularities of that, of that specific workplace – They'd use their skills and they'd 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 zoom upwards. Right. Well, the uh, there's we can generalize from that too. Why not have you have graduate schools reach out to employers, both in the community and also national corporate employers, because graduate students should have the choice. Right. Of course, we should still be trying to um, to to prepare people to be professors. That's that's the first, uh, the, the, the first purpose of graduate school, but it's not the only purpose of graduate school. Absolutely. And also to say that if this crisis has been, which is not a crisis because it's been ongoing <laughs> for 50 years, there are graduate students who have, um, have had a diverse outcomes in terms of their careers that they, that that is a, there is a, a network already there that is unrecognized um, and that institutions can maybe do more work to sort of pay attention to and track um, and bringing those graduate students back. And I think some institutions, have, especially Princeton, um, have started to do something like that. We like to close here with advice for graduate students. Do you have any words of wisdom, Lenny? Well, this, <laughs> I'm overflowing with wisdom. What can I tell you? The, uh, no, the, I have two. There, I'd, li I'd like to, to leave students with two thoughts. The first is that, that, the, that graduate education is not a zero-sum game in the sense that if you spend time preparing yourself for diverse career outcomes, you are not taking time and effort and resources away from the, re the academic outcome. There... There is such research as has been done so far, and this is, this is still a new field, but the, er, but the early findings suggest strongly that if you equip yourself with a variety of different kinds of skills, you become more attractive to academic employers. So it's actually something where your entire dossier benefits if you prepare yourself for diverse outcomes. It isn't a case of taking from, from Peter to pay Paul. Mm -hmm. 
The, the second and final piece of advice I have, this is a, an axiom, if you want. I've, I've been, I have said it to many graduate student audiences. You are the CEO of your own graduate education. That is to say, you're in charge of it. I don't mean to suggest that you are a corporate employer, but the metaphor is uh, appropriate, I think, because CEOs have a board, a board of advisors, uh, who advise them. And you can think of your teachers and whoever else you, uh, you, you might acquire as, uh, as a mentor as that board of advisors. They're there to give you advice. The decisions you make, you should be making because you're the one who has to live the outcome. Mm -hmm. So don't give away the steering wheel in your graduate career. Even if you think your advisor wants to take it, you need it mm -hmm. because you're the one who lives your life, so you're the one who should choose its course. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for your time, Lenny. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode. This is Associate Dean Eva Kubu again. The Grad Futures podcast is brought to you by the Graduate School at Princeton University. Our team includes executive producer and host, graduate student Helen Wenina of the English Department, editorial director, assistant dean James Van Wyck, technical director, Elio Geo of African American Studies, Marketing, Promotion, and Logistical Support by Coordinator Amanda Peacock. And Audio Editing by Francine Henry. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please rate and review. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for tuning in. See you next time.